The premier event for infection prevention and control is coming to San Antonio this June. APIC's annual conference brings you the latest research, innovative products, and practical knowledge to help you prevent infection. From inspiring keynotes to thought-provoking panel discussions, APIC 24 curates an extraordinary platform for knowledge exchange. Meet IPs from around the world who face the same daily challenges as you. If you work in infection prevention and control, you don't want to miss this event. Learn more and register to join us in person or virtually at annual.apic.org. You're listening to The 5 Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Hey, everybody. It's Sylvia. Hey, Hannah. Hey, Sylvia. It's uh, Hannah here. And we're really excited because we, we've we been talking a lot about infections, but not yet about the source of where they're really coming from. So, you know, we say, oh, well, you might have a viral infection and a bacterial infection. And they're like, OK, well, then it's stemming from a virus or a bacteria. But wanted to, you know, get a little down and dirty with exactly what that really means. And, you know, fungal infection, I immediately think, Oh, that's kind of gross. Uh, but we're excited because, you know, to talk about that with us, we've got Lynn Fine, who's an infection preventionist at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York, uh, someone that I've had the pleasure of working with on a couple of online courses as well. Uh, so we're excited to have her. So we'll be chatting with her in just a little bit. So today's uh, episode then is virus, viruses, bacteria, fungi. Oh, my. Because I think we don't talk too much about fungus and fungi and fungal infections but that's a thing that's a thing out there in yeah. fact there's outside some of con- athlete's foot i think i'm not <laughs> quite too familiar with the fungal exactly. infection. and that may not even be a fungal infection i might just assume it is yeah no so fungi are, are something that we haven't talked too much about but i think lynn is going to share some information um yeah i'm really excited too because i think people really need to understand what the source is what these critters are um some are good some are bad and I think the good part is is crucial that we that we talk about today as well because I think people do think of microbes and germs as these bad things but there are natural there's natural bacteria that is that works well with your gut and all these other biological components that make your body work that also you know come in the form of of bacteria or so you know that's going to be an interesting point of this and then we we might get into some uh some conversations about some poop too. Ooh, so poop. Uh, everybody loves talking about poop. Yeah. So that's uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into uh, some ways that um, you know poop can actually help you. But poop. we'll we'll keep that as we'll, we'll keep that a, a little vague right now, so we can keep yeah. you on your toes. Yeah, don't turn your dials, people. This is really <laughs> this is important stuff. And the other thing, um, maybe Lynn will talk to us about is just some general information about how we clean up this stuff. You know, we have bacteria, we have fungi, we have viruses. They live on they live on us. I also heard it's on our skin, um, and then how it lives on surfaces. So I think she'll have a lot to tell us. And how it lives on animals. So that's another thing. Is for those of us with with some furry and maybe not furry friends. You know, reptiles are welcome as well, amphibians. Um, but you know, what what kind of diseases can we also gain from our from our four legged? Animals, friends. Uh, again, not friends. not uh, not prejudice against those that don't have four legs, but you know, we're just uh, thinking about you know our dogs, our cats, our household animals that you know might visit us in the hospital, and what what can they actually do to um, to spread disease as well? So, not going to keep it too negative, but something just to be mindful of. Yeah, absolutely. So, Lynn, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me today. So, Lynn, you're an infection preventionist up in Rochester, and uh, no doubt you have seen your fair share of viral, bacterial, fungal infections. Maybe for our listeners, you could share a little bit about what the difference is between uh, virus, bacteria, and fungi. And folks, this will be real basic. We're not going back to 10th grade biology class or, you know, um, but just the basics. 
Okay. Well, it, I think of things, microbes, also in terms of size. And of the three, viruses are the smallest. Um, and the one thing about viruses that are different from fungi or bacteria is that they can't survive by themselves. And so basically they need a host. And depending upon the virus, it will, that will determine what type of host it will infect. And once it gets into the host, it will rapidly multiply and divide and then at some point destroy the host cells in which it's in and then replicate and transmit its vi viral progeny, you know, through either um, having, having a virus particle be expelled into the air and someone else breathing it in. So they're transmitted that way. Um, Bacteria so, are next. Oh, I'm sorry. So, no. so the viruses need us. They need. Yes, they do. Oh, they need a host. Okay, got it. Um, next are bacteria, which are bigger than viruses but smaller than fungi, and they uh, come both. Uh, they can be both beneficial as well as harmful. So there are good bacteria and there are bad bacteria. And um, depending upon what site in the body they are, um, that might also dictate if they cause infection or not. So you can have a bacteria that normally lives in your gut, but if it gets into your bloodstream, it's going to be a serious event. Okay. And, and they, um, bacteria have a generation time of every 20 minutes. So basically every 20 minutes they're having um, offspring. Oh my so goodness. That, <laughs> I know, really wow. fast. than rabbits or hamsters. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So that allows them to evolve very quickly in response to antibiotics or in response to disinfectants that are out there. And so we have to be mindful of that. Wow. But, but they're also good bacteria as well. You know, if anybody eats yogurt, um, we wouldn't have yogurt if it wasn't for bacteria. So, again, we got to give them, you know, give them props when, you know, when we can. Like cheese, um, right? Is Cheese has yep, bacteria cheese. on it. Like, Absolutely. Like blue cheese? Is that blue stuff? Is that? Well, that's, that's a fungus. So oh, we can talk about that. Now. All perfect right. Perfect segue. <laughs> um, Fungi are, are the largest, if you will, in, in terms of comparing themselves to viruses and bacteria. And um, while bacteria are single-celled organisms, meaning that it's just one cell is a bacterial, um, essentially, organism, fungi um, are more than one cell. And um, they can also be beneficial and harmful, uh, depending upon what the organism is as well as who the host is. So, um, you know, kind of the, being in the right place at the right time, a certain, a certain fungus can cause an infection or not, depending upon how, how the host reacts to it. And a lot of fungi are found in water, soil. You know, they're, they're like environmental organisms. Like a mold. Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh. Exactly. I think we've all seen molds in, you know, in the environment, in your refrigerator, you know. Um, so we, we can, we find them in, in the environment, but a lot of times they can, you know, cause infection if they get introduced into a host. Um, so, so they are pathogenic, and some of them are, uh, but also beneficial. Again, a lot of the beer we drink and the bread we oh. eat, you know, due to fungi, um, and fun fact, the, you know, the first antibiotics were found because of mold, um, you know, which are produced by molds. So a lot of the antibiotics that we, you know, had decades ago were first isolated from, from fungi. Very cool. And that you, really leads yeah. into our another piece where, you know, we've been talking about antibiotic resistance. So we've, we've covered, you know, the antibiotic stewardship piece of it, but sort of the history behind 
antibiotic resistance and, you know, how these organisms, I guess part of it is because they can populate so quickly, it means that just like it's almost an accelerated evolution. So whereas we've, you know, over centuries and thousands of years, we've adjusted to our environment they're doing at it they're doing it at a much faster rate it sounds like especially since now that we are exposing ourselves in all different ways to to antibiotics that it's giving them the ability to to grow their their armor exactly exactly so you know there are, are different mechanisms by which antibiotics you know act and um just as soon as we can create an antibiotic the bacteria are developing ways to get around them. So, you know, making, you know, making classes of antibiotics almost obsolete because of the fact that there's resistance. And um, sometimes resistance can be transferred very easily from one organism to another. So um, that also kind of gives the microbes an upper hand when it comes to being, um, you know, being resistant to certain antibiotics, you know, in terms of mechanisms, we can, you know, stop the bugs from growing, we can stop them from making proteins, but um, stop them from having, you know, antibiotics go in and out of the cell. But the bacteria have ways of, you know, chewing up antibiotics or actually pumping the antibiotics out of the cell so they can't act. And so the mechanisms of action are being met pretty quickly by by the bacteria and, and fungi in terms of being able to make themselves resistant and viruses as well in terms of new drug development and viruses evolve just as quickly. And so certain um, drugs that we use to treat certain viruses need to be um, changed or adapted like the influenza vaccines because the viruses can change their antigens so readily uh, what vaccine that may work one year may not work another. So Lynn, first of all, I got to say, thank you. I wish you were my high school teacher because um, <laughs> I think I've understood this better today than I did long ago. <laughs> so thank you. Um, one thing I've heard, and this speaks to how you clean it up. I mean, we hear this term biofilm and bio Mm -hmm. burden. So can you tell our listeners about, you know, there's bacteria everywhere. We're talking about maybe numbers and the amount. And then what happens when these organisms decide they're just going to all cluster together and create this, this huge biofilm? Can you share some information about that? Sure. Sure. It almost sounds like the name of a horror movie, you know, (laughs) biofilm. Um, But so, so, you know, we, we think of this in terms of devices that go into the body, um, like um, catheters and any artificial um, devices that are implanted, such as artificial joints. And, you know, at, at some point, the, the body will recognize that as foreign and, you know, they will deposit, you know, sometimes uh, tissue or blood or it'll epithelialize um, Wow, and that's a big word. Point, What's epithelialized? Well, What's that? it will, the body will essentially form cells around it. Okay. Around this foreign, foreign object. And um, sometimes bacteria get attached to that. And then they will essentially form a layer. And the thing about biofilms and what makes them really hard to treat is that, you know, if you think of it, um, I always kind of thought of biofilms as like, you know, watching people play rugby and everybody piles up on top of each other. Oh, yeah. And, and the bacteria that are at the bottom of that pile don't, um, don't interact well with the environment in the sense that if then you're giving someone an antibiotic, that antibiotic is not going to get to the bottom of that pile very well. Only the surface. Okay. Oh. Right. Right. So they don't. So they don't see that antibiotic. So they're essentially they're just going to keep growing. Got it. And um, some antibiotics actually only work on bacteria that are actually growing. So if you're not growing, that antibiotic is not going to help you. 
um, so that this biofilm or, you know, bunches and bunches of bacteria will just stay there. And if you are, you know, if it's a biofilm that's in a central line, you know, a line that's going into somebody's bloodstream, and then you shoot a drug or put a drug through that line, the likelihood that some of the biofilm can be released and enter a person's bloodstream, you know, is a real possibility. And now you have bacteria that were sitting in a catheter and now they're, you know, swimming around your body. Got it. So, so Hannah was mentioning, I think at the beginning, um, and, and this is the part, the poo part of the show. I think we want to get to that <laughs> yes, because, absolutely. you know, we've heard, we've seen in, in the media, and I know there's some, some great articles out. I know that the American Journal of Infection Control has some, some great articles on this fecal transplantation and and what that means for clostridium difficile that nasty deadly diarrhea that uh is a challenge for hospitals and patients long-term care facilities i know that it's pretty common in there and so you know my understanding of it and this is where we need some clarification from the experts here is that really basically they're taking healthy poo at the mic you know at, at a very small level from one person and putting it in you know the body of someone who has this deadly diarrhea, this clostridium difficile. And so, you know, when you think the way we kind of were thinking about it, it's like a poo swap. You know, you're getting you're getting good poo and putting it to replace the bad one. Yeah, we're talking about poo people. It's true. But (laughs) but it's I've I've heard that it's ninety eight percent effective in treating clostridium difficile where the antibiotics just aren't doing it. So it's, yeah, it's very true. You know, and it's one of these things, I think when we read about it, you know, we were like, oh my gosh. But then, you you know, after a while, it's kind of like, well, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, it, it, se- it seems like such, you know, uh, such a great answer to a question because, or a problem, because, you know, this, this organism, uh, Clostridium difficile, you know, has really, you know, we talked about bacteria changing every, uh, evolving every 20 minutes. This you know, this organism has changed dramatically since, you know, since I've been in the field um, where initially it would have been just kind of a self-limiting GI illness and you would have had diarrhea for a couple of days and, you know, then you were done. But now um, the organism has evolved. It's producing toxins and people are are losing part of their colons or dying from this organism. So, you know, there was a real need to come up with something that would, um, you know, help people who had this, this organism. And so, yeah, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, um, the bacteria causes disease in people who have, number one, have had antibiotics, which kind of depletes your gut of the beneficial bacteria, and then you're exposed to the organism, which then can invade your body and cause a disease. So basically, you know, if, if, the, if, if, a, patient, if a person has, is on antibiotics and, you know, depleting their gut flora, think of it as like, you know, uh, a parking lot that all of a sudden, you know, used to be filled with cars and now is empty because the antibiotic has killed all the good flora. The C. diff comes in and can park anywhere and, you know, take up, you know, take up shop and cause disease. So what someone's fecal transplant is doing is essentially, you know, causing another traffic jam and, you know, putting more cars in the parking lot so the C. diff can't set up shop. And, you know, it's, it's used, I think, primarily for people who have recurrent forms of this disease. So once you have it, you are more likely to get it again if, if you know, rather than um, it's not a rat, it can, it, it, it can recur in patients. And so this treatment, I think, um, is designed probably mostly for them, um, but it is incorporated into the new guidelines that are put out by um, the Infectious Disease Society of America. So this is something that, you know, is now becoming more uh, mainstream uh, therapy. And so the way I was sort of envisioning this was monster trucks are now in the parking lot versus a, <laughs> a variety of potentially compact vehicles that were there before. So this this fecal transplantation is bringing in the big guns. 
Yeah. And I, by the way, folks, not to do at home, this should be done by uh, the professionals. Correct. And I do know that the FDA is also looking at um, managing sort of the samples and, and how that's, those are screened. And so it's, it's becoming more common, but not something that you would want to endeavor on your own. And then, don't little... try this at home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I think related to this, and this goes into another point I brought up earlier, is, you know, we 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 just discussed the fecal transplants, and I I recently learned that there is a dog in Canada that can smell out Clostridium difficile. So there there yeah, I think it was like a Springer Spaniel named Ang- Angus who has the ability to to sniff out. Have you heard of that, Lynn? Um, I have heard of it, um, but, you know, I don't know how sensitive or specific a dog would be compared to our PCR testing. So (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) And, um, you know, we've talked about the bacteria. We've talked about viruses on some of our shows. Um, One thing that probably doesn't get as much play or maybe the, the, the listeners out there aren't as familiar are fungal infections. And there's a pretty nasty one brewing um, in the long-term care facility, I think, Candida auris. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that is one of those organisms that has evolved a lot of drug resistance. And, you know, we have seen it, but it's not as widespread as some of its other Canada cousins are. But, um, you know, we, we do do surveillance for it because we will have to kind of um, change our treatment modalities if we know it's Canada auris versus another Canada species that we see more regularly. So, yeah, long-term care facilities and intensive care units where people are very sick and, and vulnerable. Now, I did kind of want to, before we close out the episode, I wanted to briefly kind of touch on some some zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic. Wow. What is that? Because I, I learned, I remember, <laughs> I remember in college, it's not zoonotic because that would be three O's. So it's, zo- uh-huh. I, I, my understanding is it's zoonotic diseases um, because I was reading the other day that the CDC um, on their website, it says that scientists estimate that more than six out of every 10 Known infectious diseases in people are actually spread from animals. And three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases in people are spread from animals as well. And so, you know, this kind of ties into, you know, animals and healthcare facilities. And, you know, I, I think I watched a video the other day of, of a horse walking through a what? hospital and visiting. I don't believe you. Yeah. I, I, oh, wow. Yeah. And so, you know, I'd love to get some some thoughts from you, you know, from a from a viral bacterial for at the microbe level, you know, talking about zoonotic diseases and, and sort of what, what that looks like and, and what we should think about. I know basic things like, you know, when you're going to a petting zoo, wash your mm-hmm. hands, you know, afterwards, because you just don't know, especially when they're, when they're farm animals, you don't know where they're coming from, but just want to touch on that a little bit more. Absolutely. Kind of like the proverbial biting the hand that feeds you kind of thing. Exactly. But, um, <laughs> um, well, you know, and, and that's why, we have in our facility, we have um, therapy dogs that, you know, have to maintain meticulous health records and we allow them in, but we don't allow, you know, patients' own pets to come in because we, we know, we don't know how well they are um, maintained in terms of up to date on their vaccinations because there are a lot of diseases that can be transmitted from animals to humans. And, you know, I think the one we think about mostly is rabies, you know, which is a viral disease and we vaccinate dogs to prevent them from be, you know, getting this virus. But there are also um, uh, bacteria as well um, and parasites that can uh, go from either dogs or cats to humans, um, especially if you've been bitten by a dog or a cat. Um, And we know that cats can be colonized with uh, like toxoplasma, which can be, which is a parasite and can be quite devastating to people that, women that are pregnant. So that's why women who are pregnant, you know, shouldn't change their litter boxes or the cat's litter boxes, not their litter boxes. (laughs) Well, that's, Um, yeah. yeah. (laughs) No judgment um, out there. (laughs) Right. 
Um, we, we've seen infections uh, transmitted from birds to humans and, you know, not to leave out the reptiles. You know, reptiles can transmit diseases too um, from turtles down to Komodo dragons. So they can transmit what we think of mostly as salmonella, which is a bacteria. So, you know, I think your, your advice was well taken. You know, just wash your hands before um, and after handling your your pet. <laughs> Great um, advice. But, and, and, you know, and also I think um, what you were talking about before about um, newly, newly developing or newly isolated viruses um, really are or have been documented to be transmitted, you know, making the jump from animals to humans. We think of Ebola and dengue and, you know, so those kind of viruses, you know, pretty much probably did have animal hosts initially, and then, um, you know, made the leap to infect humans. Wow. Well, you know, Lynn, on our show, we like to ask our guests just what's bugging them. So as we've been talking about viruses, bacteria, fungi, oh my, what's bugging you? What would you like uh, our listeners to know about? Um, What's bugging me? Well, um, I think, you know, the one thing that we're seeing a lot of is, is antibiotic resistance. And I think educating people on when it's appropriate to get an antibiotic and when it's not appropriate to get an antibiotic. Um, if someone has influenza, a lot of the treatment is supportive in that you're treating the symptoms rather than uh, treating the virus. Um, so if you truly do have influenza, yes, it's appropriate to get an antiviral, but if uh, you go to your doctor and you have a cold and it's much more likely to be a viral illness, maybe not during flu season, it's you know not appropriate to you know start antibiotics and ask questions later. So I think that's one of the things that's bugging me. Um, also, um, I think while we talk a lot about antibiotic stewardship, I think it's also important to think about the appropriate use of of testing and collection of tests that are appropriate, you know, meaning the right patient at the right time and ordering the right test. Um, We see a lot of patients in our hospital, you know, that may have diarrhea and may be due to C. diff and may be due to something else. And so in making sure that, um, you know, there's thought put into what tests are being ordered uh, because test is going to have a result and then you want to be able to in- interpret it appropriately. Got so it. that's pretty much what's bugging me now. <laughs> Lynn, thanks so much. Like I said, you've really schooled me on the differences between or among bacteria, fungi and viruses. So we want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank Hannah. Thank you, Sylvia. And for more information, check out www.apic.org. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule and doing your part to prevent infection. Because remember, infection prevention is everybody's business. To hear more Five Second Rule episodes and learn more about how you can help, go to apic.org forward slash five second rule. The Five Second Rule is produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Staff including Hannah Andrews, Ricky Dana, Christine Miller, and Sylvia Cavedo, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alfin.